We turn to a reading today from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. Uh, the book of Isaiah is an anthology of sorts. It spans the history of about 200 years, from the year, five, from the year 738 B.C., the, king, the year that King Uzziah died, all the way to about 539, when the people of Judah returned from exile in Babylon. And a lot can happen in 200 years. Our own nation's probably it isn't much more than 200 years old. We see kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Jerusalem is captured by the Babylonians in 586, and its people are forced to live in exile in Babylon. But after a couple of generations, the people return. They return to the city of Jerusalem, a city that they claim is their own, but they've never seen. A city they know about through stories and poems that have been preserved and memories of previous generations. So even though a lot happens in 200 years, there are threads that tie the whole of Isaiah together from beginning to end. And one of those threads is this imagery of light and darkness. Isaiah 5.20 says, one of the sins of an unjust society is to confuse the two, to call evil good and good evil, to put darkness for light and light for darkness. Isaiah 8.22 says that when a society is broken and unfaithful, people will look up to heaven and down to the earth, but will see only distress and darkness. But when God acts, when God acts, there is a light that shatters the darkness. The passage that we heard from, on Christmas Eve from Isaiah 9.2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Chapter 59, the one right before the one we read this morning, is, is a chapter full of poetic darkness. It is a prophetic indictment against a people who are returning from exile, and while the justices have been piled on them, they continue to treat each other with the same levels of injustice. Into this darkness, Isaiah speaks words of hope, a prophetic hope that in the end, God will stay true to the covenant that God has made with God's people. A covenant of grace that is permanent and unshakable. This is the vision that we hear today through Isaiah's poetry. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but... The Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Look up, lift your eyes, and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of nations shall come to you, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Isaiah's vision, we can keep the lights up. It's, it's a rainy day, and, and folks get a little bit heavy eyelided. I know. It's true, especially when I'm preaching. It's true. No. If they don't come up, that's fine. So Isaiah's vision of, uh, was grounded in a very specific time. But we also know that the prophet is referring not to just one time, but to every time. Every time, because we too, in our time, know what it is to live in darkness. When we look to our leaders for wisdom and yet receive only raw ambition and deceit. When we look for justice from lawmakers and law enforcers and yet get only self-interested policies and the shirking of responsibilities and oversight. Whenever people seek refuge, and yet receive only barriers. When people cry out for food, 
but get only empty plates and hunger. Whenever people yearn for truth, but receive only lies and empty promises, we know that we are now in one of those times when, as Isaiah describes, that we wait for the light, but lo, there is only darkness. And it doesn't take much for us to see that we are waiting for light and seeing a lot of darkness. And we might think that it is this way because it's been this way and it will always be this way. But to that, Isaiah speaks words that open our eyes. After, like after a long night's sleep, the light, the brightness surprises us with the dawning of God's grace. A grace that is undeserved and unearned and unexpected, and yet God still shines. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons and daughters returning home. Broken community restored. Shattered families healed. I've met no other group of people who have experienced more dark times in life than those I've come to know and who have been refugees. I think of those I've known. I think of people who have been forced from their lands and their countries. They've lost families and loved ones. They've been wounded by war, by economic disaster, by an environmental catastrophe. <clears throat> when I was a child, <clears throat> we lived in a single family home in Quito, Ecuador. My parents were missionaries there for eight, almost nine years. And I remember a time when I was about 11 years old, my brother was about seven years old, and we would go out into the backyard and we'd kick around our soccer ball. The yard was surrounded by walls, as, as the homes in, in Quito were. The back wall, the east wall, was the tallest one, about 10 feet high. It backed up against some sort of industrial plant, uh, some industrial yard, and they kept guard dogs on the other side of that wall. And we had a dog, his name was Laddie. He was a, a shepherd Doberman mix. I uh, wanted to call him Lassie, but my mother thought calling a boy dog Lassie wasn't appropriate, so we called him Laddie. And he would run back and forth against that back wall, and he would jump even higher by planting his paws on the wall and pushing up off the wall and put his head over this 10-foot wall. It was especially active when the, uh, the female dogs on the other side were in heat. Um, <laughs> But as Laddie got older and stronger, my father, I believe it was him anyway, had to go up there and put an extra row of bricks on the top of that wall just to make sure that he couldn't get over. So we knew that if we kicked the ball over that wall, we would never get it back. But the walls on the north and south side of the yard uh, were only about seven feet tall and Eventually, we would kick the ball over those, and we'd have to scramble up the seven-foot wall, go get the ball, throw it back over, scramble back up, and come back down. And we could do that. But then there was the southwest wall. It was also seven feet tall, but it was covered in broken glass. And there was no way to scramble up and over it. The woman who lived in that lower apartment of the house that was there she liked to keep to herself, didn't like to be bothered. She didn't speak any English, and the Spanish she spoke was, had a very strange accent to it. And she was always very cold. Emotionally and physically, it seemed, she always wore long sleeves. And mom and dad would remind me to be polite, to ask nicely whenever we kicked the ball over into her yard, and I would go and ring the doorbell and I had to screw up courage a little bit to do that. And most of the time, she would not let me in, but she would tell me to go back over and she would throw the ball over herself. But there was once where she did, I remember, let me through to her yard to pick up the ball and retrieve it on my own. I remember there were years that we would drop off special Christmas bread at her house. We would send her holiday greetings, gift, uh, little note cards, and after many years of these neighborly niceties, she invited my parents over to tea. 
and she trusted them with her story. She rolled up one of her sleeves to show numbers tattooed on her arm. She was originally from Poland and had been enslaved during World War II, forced to work at a German concentration camp brothel. And after the war, she had become a refugee, was granted entry into Ecuador, and found there a peaceful place to live apart from a world that was full of war and so different from where she had come. But the war left an indelible darkness on her life a reserved caution, a loneliness. And as a child, I was somewhat afraid of her. Yet, over time, I recognized her as my neighbor, and over time, we built a level of trust. I now find that I'm living in Sacramento, a place that has become a home for over 20,000 refugees in the last 15 years alone. The Cold War drove many Russian refugees here. The war in Iraq drove more. And now the war in Afghanistan, which once seemed so far away, has made us neighbors with over 4,000 new refugees from Afghanistan, most of whom have arrived just in the last two years. So with the help of World Relief Sacramento, our local church-based refugee resettlement agency, Carmichael Presbyterian Church has been developing relationships with our new neighbors. I sat down a couple of weeks ago on December 18th to review the results of a survey that we had helped conduct. A handful of church members went with a cultural ambassador in Afghan uh, to gather responses to a carefully crafted survey. We wanted to listen, listen to our new neighbors to find out their needs and find out how best we could serve through what we had to give. As I started to listen to the results of the survey, I learned that yes, there is a need for English language classes at a place that's within walking distance of where they live. And that yes, 90% were comfortable at having an English language class in a church. And yes, there is a need for child care, and yes, they need extra help with students and their homeworks, tutoring. They need, there's a need for after-school sports and extracurricular activities, but we kind of already knew these things. And the survey just confirmed what we had already known through anecdotal, anecdotal evidence. But what I learned next is what flipped everything on its head. Just about every person that responded said that they had a strong desire to become friends with Americans. 98% said that they were comfortable sharing their culture with others. And I realized this is not a one-way street. This is not about Carmichael Presbyterian Church being willing to arise and shine to our neighbors. This is about our neighbors being willing to shine on us, too. In fact, one of the greatest barriers to the stability and integration, to their stability and integration, is if we give and give and give without also realizing that they are assets to our community, that they have gifts to bring that enrich and inspire us as well. The only way to transform refugees into neighbors is to receive the gifts that they bring and to enter into a relationship of interdependence. The journey of refugee resettlement requires them to depend on others, to become established, to gain independence in their new country, but it also requires that we receive the gifts that they bring and be transformed by them as well. The story of Epiphany the story of the Magi, who come from the east, following the light of the star, reveals the, God's presence with us in Jesus Christ. When Isaiah calls people to justice, he does so with the image of the light of God's glory being revealed in those who were coming from far away, with the hopes and the blessing and prosperity that were for all. Our new mission statement 
which we continue to introduce over the next few months, it affirms that we respond to God's love in Jesus Christ by welcoming all and by nurturing relationships. Nurturing relationships requires that we be open to one another inside this community as well as beyond. Healthy relationships are not one way. They are back and forth. They are give and receive. And you are a generous and giving church, giving your time and your resources, serving hungry neighbors through the food closet and SOS, providing shelter for those who are experiencing homelessness through winter shelter and family promise. But are you ready to receive? Are you ready to receive? That's the reverse course. Are you ready to receive the gifts of others, to recognize the light of God's glory revealed in the smile and the story of a food closet guest? The praise of the Lord revealed to us through our new Muslim Afghan neighbor. Are you ready to see the light of God revealed in the gift of curious questions of children, the pondered philosophies of teenagers, the ruminations and stories of our elders? In us, God's light shines. Yes, it's true. But are you ready to see the light of God, sh God shining in your neighbor? That survey left me with one more insight. For a people who have fled darkness in war, lost loved ones and are now in a strange land, I expected to see survey with results that reflected a grim and painful story. But what I saw was something different. 92% of those who responded said that they were hopeful about their futures. And 100% said they were hopeful about the futures of their children. Hope in the midst of darkness. My friends, hope may well be the gift that we are being offered by our neighbors if we are ready to receive it. Isaiah says, lift up your eyes and look around. When we do, we will see this new community of God shining in surprising places. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Let us pray. God of endless light, your light rises from darkness, guiding seekers and sages alike, overwhelming us with joy. May the splendor of your dawning light grow in us and in our world until the whole creation shines with your glory. Amen.